Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer and I have with me today Rena Van Aust from Strata Central. Hi, Rena. Hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm doing well. I know that you are struggling a little bit at the moment, Rena. Can we share this? <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, unfortunately, last week, Amanda, I was walking down the stairs where I live and um, it was slippery and I was just went for a bit of a straight fall and broke the bone above my ankle, the distal fibula, as they call it. So, um, mm. yeah, at the moment, I'm actually using crutches and a knee walker to get around and um, hopefully... In about 10 days, I'll be able to walk on my boot. So, you poor yeah. sweetheart. I have seen you hobbling around, and we were just saying before we turn the recording on that everything is taking about five times longer for you, and you have my sympathy. Thanks, Amanda. For someone like me who's a very fast person and everything that I do, <laughs> that in itself is a mental struggle. <laughs> yes, you'll get there. Maybe it'll do you some good to slow down, take a yeah, breath, exactly. smell the roses. <laughs> exactly. I, can, I achieve less in a day, but at least you're right. It forces me to slow down. Yes. You're on normal person speed now, Rena. <laughs> 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 All right. Let's jump in. Aside from your broken foot, what has been challenging you this week in Strata? Well, this is an interesting case, Amanda, which I have had before, but this is a bit of a different twist. So it relates to a Strata scheme having visitor parking And in this case, disabled parking. So basically, there's two levels of car park in this particular building and the development's only a number of years old and they actually have the spaces marked out in blue with a disabled sign on there. And unfortunately, due to some issues relating to repairs and maintenance, some of the um, car spaces have had to be blocked off and people can't use their car spaces at the moment for some repairs. And therefore, some people who are genuinely disabled who have those spaces that they can't use, have now been using the disabled spaces. But unfortunately, those disabled spaces are actually owned by other people. They're not actually disabled spaces. People say that's our car space. And Mm -hmm. on the strata roll, it actually does show that, Amanda, on the strata plan, sorry, it shows that they are car space lots on the strata plan. Mm -hmm. So this particular lady whose, you know, husband is quite unwell and obviously can't park outside the building and has to park inside, she's been getting breach notices from the building manager saying, you know, you can't park here because these are owned by people, that's their private spaces and, and they've been getting complaints from those people when they come home at night that this other vehicle is parked in their space. And so the lady then contacted, the lot owner contacted council and they came down and they've written to me and they said, well, basically these spaces have to be available. And I said, well, can you please confirm that the DA contains disabled car spaces? Mm -hmm. And they said, that's correct. There's six spaces that are earmarked on this level and two spaces that are earmarked on another level. And therefore you've got to enforce that particular condition. And so um, in another scheme I used to manage many years ago, the developer had three visitor car spaces. And what he did was rather than selling them off as lots, he gave exclusive use rights to particular owners for those visitor car spaces. So they actually weren't theirs on title, but they pretty much were theirs through this exclusive use license arrangement. So in in this case, Amanda, what is your advice in terms of what the Owns Corporation can do when people have been sold lots on title that basically give them a right to park in a particular space? Now, the spaces are very small. They're not the normal you know, when you go to a shopping centre, usually visit a disabled car spaces, Amanda, are usually larger than the regular ones. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that's a criteria for disabled mm. parking, but by and large, that's been my experience. Yeah. So these ones are actually just normal size. They're actually not bigger than what they need to be. Yeah. And um, they're like the size of any other car space lot. So what's your advice? So these disabled car spaces are marked on the strata plan as being part of a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay, and people have purchased their residential lot believing that they have access to a car space because the car space forms part of their lot. Yeah, because these this development was sold off the plan. Okay, yep, sure. 
They are then car spaces that are painted in blue yes. and marked disabled. And when did the strata plan get registered? In early 17. Okay. Is the developer still around? Yep. They have painted these spaces blue because the DA required them to have X number of disabled parking spaces. That's correct. Have you seen the DA consent? Does no, it- we've been trying to get a copy of it. Okay. But this council originally said that, that it would take 20 business days and now it's, we've got another email to say it's taking an extra 10 business days. So we actually asked the council officer that, that had um, emailed me to provide me with a copy of the DA so we can have a look at that. Yeah, and see what the condition is exactly and whether it nominates which particular spaces need to be set aside for disabled parking. It may be that the developer is in breach of the DA conditions mm. and you can raise that with the council because they were supposed to provide parking in a certain area and they haven't yeah, exactly. done that. That could be what's happened. Otherwise, I wonder if having these spaces painted blue is a building defect. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we can add that to the list of all the others that are present. At yeah, the I mean, if you're talking to the developer, <laughs> that's the person I'd be talking to and say, why is my car space painted blue? And Mark's yeah, just it's hateful. Really, yeah, it's really strange because, I mean, that's what you would have thought, Amanda, but I think because this building is highly tenanted, I think that because I think tenants probably don't realise that oh, that's, I was told to park here, therefore, I mean, they don't particularly worry about whether it's supposed to be disabled or not. So, yeah. And who knows when they when these owners were given inspections before settlement, when they're still not, not blue and then after they painted them blue. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> so, it sounds like a developer taking a shortcut to me and I'd be raising it with them and getting your hands on the council conditions. Yeah, and so I'll keep you posted on that, Amanda, what happens when I, once I receive the DA. But I just thought that would be an interesting one where, um, you know, I've seen visitor spaces through exclusive use arrangements and licence agreements, but mm-hmm. this is, um, I think, a new one. And I wonder what power that council has to actually enforce because yeah, in a sense sure. they're saying to me, well, you know, you've, this is a DA approval condition, you've got to enforce it. So, yeah, but I'm pretty sure the DA condition didn't say, well, let's put it this way, the building would be approved for a certain number of lots with car spaces. Yes. And then there would have been, in addition, a certain number of disabled car spaces. Yeah. So either way, neither of those requirements have been met. Yeah. Okay. Gosh, you come up with some good ones, Rena. <laughs> Just when you think you've heard it all. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Definitely let us know how that one plays out. Very yeah. interesting. My challenge for this week relates to the concept of a building's financial year. And we have talked about this a few times recently on the podcast, Rena, talking about accounts and budgets and approving accounts for the financial year. And in the course of this discussion, I have had one of the members inside the Your Strata Property membership community ask a question about this term financial year. Where does it come from? Is it in the legislation? Why Do we all operate as if this is some fixed, well-known concept, a building's financial year, when as far as this member could see, and I've had a look and I can't find it, it's actually not set out in our Strata Schemes Management Act at all. Do you have any thoughts on this, Rena? Well, I think it's an arbitrary date that's been set as to when the developer has sold the required number of lots when the first AGM is held and then obviously Mm. the accounting period will start usually at that time. So the financial year is set once the first AGM is held and levies are then being raised from a certain point in time. So they have to start at one date and then finish 12 months later. So, Well, here's the thing. Let me backtrack because I believe this term is mentioned once in our Strata Schemes Management Act and that's in relation to the convening of the AGM. Section 18 of the Strata Schemes Management Act, an owner's corporation must hold an AGM once in each financial year of the corporation. Now, Mm -hmm. this came in when our new legislation started in 2016. That is the only place that I can find that term used. And that's why, in my view, it becomes important to understand how the financial year is set when it commences and whether it can be changed. And we've talked about that before as well, Rena. Yeah, that it can be. Yeah. It seems odd to me that you would have a requirement that you must hold your AGM once in each financial year of the corporation, but there is otherwise no guidance around when the financial year starts. Yeah. So basically the financial year is set when the first AGM is held and levies are raised. So 
I mean, I can give you an example. Let's say your first AGM is held in the middle of, say, January, then you probably have levies, you've got to get 30 days notice for levy, so it will probably start 1st of March. And therefore, in a sense, 1st of March becomes the beginning of the financial year and end in February of the following year. So that's sort of how it's been set. But there's nothing to say that you can't change the actual financial year, which we've done on many occasions. Recently, um, we had a building that wanted to change the year so that they have their AGM bit earlier in the year. So we now have a nine-month financial year period rather than a 12-month one. Yeah, and I think this becomes relevant where buildings are not having regular annual general meetings and owners Mm. getting concerned about budgets and levies and money that's going out that's not in accordance with a budget that's been approved and running out of money because levies haven't been raised. And when Mm -hmm. the owners go to look at this requirement for when AGMs must be held and see this term financial year, it's quite natural, I think, to then ask the question, well, what is our financial year? And Mm. how do I find that out? How is that set? When was it set? And not having that guidance in the legislation, I think, is unfortunate and confusing. (laughs) Yeah, I think it is, Amanda, but I suppose in any sense, you know, like in Australia we have a financial year ending 30 June and in the US and and Europe it ends 31 December. And I suppose for strata schemes because there's no, yeah, it's not defined as such, it can be at any time really. And also the other thing I think um, is important to note that sometimes people's levy cycles are out of sync with their Mm -hmm. financial year end. So for those that sort of don't really understand what I'm saying, um, you might have a 30 June year end, but your levies start from September and therefore the levies, instead of being like one July to the end of September, one October and then one January and then one April, so that all the levies are raised in that financial year and when you're doing your budgets, it all lines up. We have one that as a 30 June year end that we've inherited and it goes from one September and then it goes from one December, and it's so there's two months that it's going to be out of whack with our with our financial year end. So, what we're going to do in this particular scheme is actually have one of the levy quarters just being for two months, so that we don't, mm. so that we can line it up, Amanda. And um, yes, but again, that causes confusion with people because the levy is going to be less; it's prorated, and it's interesting to note that many people don't have very much financial knowledge in their own lives in terms of how things work, let alone when we try and change your ends and try and change levy cycles. Mm. Um, it does cause a lot of confusion, as you've said, Amanda, because this whole notion of what is a financial year isn't really like – people understand in their own life you've got to do your own tax by, you know, tax your ends 30 June, but mm. when it comes to financial year – and you have till May, I think, for people, you can lodge your tax return by May the following year. So mm. in a sense, I think we're doing that now in Strider. It's sort of following the real world. <laughs> You don't have a set time to lodge. Yes. And I think you've hit the nail on the head where people uh, may not be as financially literate as accountants or other Mm. professionals may be. These things are very... Complicated. Yeah, and quickly become confusing. Anyway, and we've just done our bit to make it more confusing. Exactly. (laughs) Sorry, everyone. (laughs) But if there is comfort in the knowledge that we too are confused and we don't have the answers and we're looking things up and trying to find them for you, then uh, happy to provide that level of confusion slash (laughs) comfort. Yeah, definitely, Amanda. All right, let's move on to lighter things. Do you have a win for this week, Rena? Yeah, so um, last week we were appointed to manage a new scheme and basically they've given me just a rundown of the matters that are actually happening. Um, We don't take over till a few months' time. But they've actually got a draft statement of claim that's been served on them. So basically this particular owner is threatening to file this particular statement of claim against the, the strata committee and I said, well, you know, you've got to put this forward to your insurance broker, ask your manager to do that because there's actually a legal defence claim policy within your insurance that um, most strata schemes now have. So they were quite surprised that, that this was actually available and that they weren't even aware of it. And, I mean, this is a very, I can see a very litigious building and um, and I think people threat giving you a draft statement of claim saying that if you don't do what I want, if this person doesn't resign, <laughs> then we're going to file it. It's like, oh, okay, that's a nice way to, to start looking after a building. But I think a lot of people don't understand 
that there is a policy when a lot owner does sue the owners corporation that is available where the insurer then would have to obviously approve the the lawyer perhaps that sometimes they have a panel of lawyers that they use or you can put forward your own lawyer amanda and then they'll say okay that's fine we just want to make sure that can you make sure you send us the bills we want to know what the strategy is that's being put forward by the lawyer and um yeah so at least that's one thing that the owners corporation obviously can take some comfort with but it's important that your strata manager is aware of this. So for, for managers out there and, and lot owners, there is most, I think most policies now would have this legal defence claim. Yeah, it is something that I too see buildings and sometimes strata managers forget about until yeah. I might get involved and say, hey, this is a, a defence position we're taking here. Do you have a policy that would cover this? And if you're not sure, check in with your insurer and often they are pleasantly surprised that they can get some money back for their legal fees. So very good reminder. It's funny, man, and one of my um, colleagues was telling me from another company that they had a situation like this where obviously they put the insurer on notice about the, this particular claim, which ended up being large. And when the bills were put forward by the lawyer, they said that the bill was like three times the amount that any other lawyer would charge that's on their panel. And their panel is quite, I means quite a big insurer mm-hmm. with quite a lot of lawyers. So I think sometimes lot owners and strata committees are a bit shocked because they've engaged the lawyer beforehand, not realising that that is covered under the claim. Mm. I think also another bit of a shock is when they find out that their lawyer is basically overcharging. I mean, in terms of you know, being three times more than any other lawyer for the same type of thing, mm. uh, I think it should ring alarm bells. And I think and sometimes I think um, strata schemes and owners corporations feel that they're taken advantage of when mm when they're in the situation when they are being sued by a lot owner because they don't really have any other choice but to actually defend the claim or, or settle depending on what the issue is. But sometimes when people are vulnerable, there are people that sometimes take advantage of owners' corporations being a bigger entity or they can afford to pay because it's not one person paying, et cetera. So mm. it's something to think about, I think, when owners' corporations and strata communities are looking at their lawyers and selecting it to represent them. And certainly more competition in that space, I think, yes. is a very good thing. And I th- yeah. think probably over the last 10, 15 years or so, we have seen more lawyers enter the space and yeah. providing that range of choice, whereas maybe 20 years ago, there was only a handful to choose from and you chose and worked with the lawyer that your strata manager used for all the same buildings. But I think we're seeing owners become far more educated and understanding their options, jumping on Google, doing some searching and finding someone who they feel comfortable with that they can trust and putting their best foot forward. Yeah, that's exactly right, Amanda. Okay, well, my win for this week is also about insurance and I'm coming back to what I had raised as a challenge way back in episode 165. At that time, I shared that I was having great difficulty on behalf of a client getting an insurance claim accepted and paid for a rather serious flood event. So there'd been some major flooding towards the end of last year. My client's apartment had been completely flooded, damaged contents, uh, damage to structures as well. And they'd made a claim both on their contents insurance and the owners corporation had put through a claim by the building insurance. And when I was talking about this in episode 165, I said, we have been waiting about five months and we have not got a satisfactory response from the building insurer. And I was at a bit of a loss as to how somebody could be put in that position for such a long time waiting to be effectively reimbursed because they had done a lot of the rectification themselves so that they could move back into their home. And I'm happy to announce today that the Strata Insurer has come through. We have had a decision, an indemnity and a payment has been made. And what I wanted to highlight is the fact that in my view, this only really happened because a new broker came onto the scene. And this was a new broker who came along with a new strata manager who was appointed to the building. And this broker, for whatever reason, was able to do things that the previous broker could not do and got the strata insurer moving and got a decision on the claim and payment made rather promptly. So uh, I hate to say it, but it's who you get, who you know, Uh, Mm. whether you've got somebody competent and professional on the other side helping you or whether you've got someone who's just dropping the ball and not picking up the file, which I can imagine is incredibly frustrating for not just managers, but for owners. And my clients had me there helping them, but they were paying me for that Mm. so that they could get that across the line. 
That's very interesting you should mention about insurance brokers, Amanda, because um, you were saying earlier that there is a proliferation of new strata lawyers that wasn't prevalent back 15 or 10 years ago even, uh, whereas now there's many to choose from. So I think that that space has also changed for insurance brokers. So now when you go to an industry conference, now there's before you had lots of lawyers having stalls, now you have insurance brokers. So that space again has changed. And I think what you're saying is so important because getting a quote annually. I mean, I know it may be difficult in some cases, but overall, I think for most buildings that you know, don't have many claims or they're pretty straightforward, I suppose the broker's job would be quite limited to the activity at that time, at the renewal period. However, the main thing that I think one should look for as a strata committee or a strata managing agent when looking at advising on which brokers perhaps and its corporations should consider is really the claims management because the claims management is where all the work is, is where, you know, you might have two, three claims in one year, you might have a huge claim, you might have the claim that you're talking about, Amanda, where this prevented the owners living in their apartment and just changing brokers, someone who's, you know, got the tenacity, the knowledge, and also I think fighting for their client. Yes, uh, very good point there, Rena. I think we are seeing that change in the sector and I think it's a good thing. Similar to lawyers, brokers, more competition, better people and being focused on the needs of the client and remembering who the client is is such a key point. Exactly. So that's the win for this week from my side. Anything else you'd like to add, Rena? No, Amanda, just trying to... Get through the day with my <laughs> al- with my ailment, or I wouldn't call it an ailment, with my current disability. But yes, it makes you actually think about people who can't get on, you know, public transport. Who, mm-hmm. you know, stairs are a challenge. I mean, obviously, I'm young and fit enough to be able to use crutches, but I think about older people trying to get up my stairs, for example. I mean, God, I mean, it takes me like nearly 15, 20 minutes to get up there, but puts it all in perspective. Yeah, exactly. So I think um, we need to think more about people that have disabilities and and can't access stairs and other things that we just take for granted. Yeah, we just won't steal anybody's car spaces in the meantime. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm thinking about those too. (laughs) All right, I'll catch you next time, Rena. Okay, bye, Amanda. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today?